Greetings, welcome to In Depth. I'm DK Ross Star, and the light rising out of the West, the UWI, is celebrating the progress of Professor Sharon Hack, the first astronomer to rise to the regional university's highest academic rank. Now, the UE celebrates Stella Scholar, and we are very happy to be speaking with her in just a moment. Welcome, Professor. How are you doing? Hello, DK. It's fantastic to be here and have a chat with you today. Yeah, you're getting used to you're getting used to the to the title as yet. Absolutely not. I just don't answer when anyone says prof anymore. It's going to take a little getting used to. Okay, but but starting in astronomy, did you see yourself making history like this? And I guess we we'll get into it a little deeper. But did you see yourself here at that point in time? Short answer, no, not at all. I am one of those persons that did it just for the love of the profession. And all around me were voices growing up that, first of all, that you can't even do astronomy in Trinidad. You can't study it. There was always all those negative voices. And uh, um, so I thought I would, I would not even get a job with it, as everyone said. So I always had my plan B. I love physics. I teach physics. But the universe conspires for you. I truly believe if you have a passion. So it was never the goal to be a professor. The goal was pretty much sharing my own love for astronomy and the universe in whichever way I could by research and teaching. Well, take me through that process now because... And in terms of some of the milestones along that journey, I'm hearing the passion and you're speaking about the love, but a young female from this geographic location to say, okay, well, this is what I am going to do. How, take me through that journey a little bit, thanks. So many, many decades ago, there was a little girl born in a village in India right that far back <laughs> but anyway it does start there it does actually my earliest memories are probably at about the age of five looking up and the skies i thought were like a bowl over us and you like you said there are milestone points at around the age of nine i actually took up a pair of binoculars that belonged to my father and as i say i looked up and then i never looked back down and it just it's like it festers in you the passion so it was a natural progression the sciences into physics mathematics and then doing an undergraduate degree at the university of the west indies with a major in physics and it was after that point it's like do i don't i so the question is that one can pursue your passion in astronomy without even becoming a professional you know so that option is always there you could be an amateur astronomer but the calling it kept calling so i went on to do my mphil in astronomy and physics and uh, um, was lucky to get an opportunity to do my uh, phd as a spit site degree with the university of virginia and like I said, it's all, the journey has been a lot of serendipity. As I returned, my former supervisor, actually, um, he resigned and there was an opening. I mean, how serendipitous is that? And so I applied and I got really lucky. I got in into the post as a lecturer, but it was never that thought of, okay, I'm trying, I'm going to be a professor one day, not at all. So it was, it's been very overwhelming. It's been very overwhelming and very humbling for the university to honor a staff like this. And you, and you started answering some of the questions I have in terms of like, what kind of academic path would you have to follow to get to this point? So you spoke about some of those things, but I also want to ask, so yes, there are the classes, the courses, the modules for you to do, but what is happening outside of that? Is this, is this still you with the binoculars? Are there astronomy clubs that you can be a part of? What's helping to feed that fire? Okay, that's actually a very interesting point that you've raised there. Yes, the binoculars is always at my side. So um, I myself have been engaged very much, not just in research and teaching, but also in outreach. So Trinidad is very full of um, people with great enthusiasm for astronomy. And compared to some of the other islands, it really does well here. So there's a Trinidad and Tobago Astronomical Society that I went to as a child, actually. They've been there for that long. 
And then there is the um, Carina Caribbean Institute of Astronomy. And there's several of the smaller groupings as well. And they engage in a lot of stargazing and the wondrous things in the sky. My path is more on the professional aspect where I'm engaged in research actually, but I do spend a lot of my time giving public lectures. I have my YouTube channel. I work a lot with kids. Kids are so excited by astronomy, you will not believe. So it's really, really wonderful. There's this um, on the YouTube channel, I have a show called The Enchanted Forest and kids send in questions in astronomy and well, we tell them what the answers are with some toys and fun props. No, you saying that and I'm writing it down the enchanted forest because I have some I have some younger people there who are very interested and uh, so I will get this to them. But I want you to plug a professional a little bit, thank you, in terms of saying, okay, well, this study, these, these, these actions, they help in this way. Give me some of the pros of astronomy, thanks. All right, so astronomy has a very bad reputation what you will do with astronomy. It was actually said once upon a time that you can't eat a telescope. And what that really meant, pause, think on it, was that what is astronomy good for? It can't feed a population. It can't uh, um, deal with illnesses and things like that. But the power of astronomy is something that beckons all of us. And today I will tell you, DK, that the skill sets that you learn in pursuing a field like astronomy, which is mathematics, physics, programming, dealing with large amounts of data, image processing, um, astronomers are excellent at it. So it builds a lot of skill sets for a lot of the skills that we need in the present era right now and going into the future. And what really inspires me I mean, I got so many wonderful notes from people when this professorship news came out and so many of them were students. And all I could respond was that you inspire me. It was the students, even as I go out into schools, they are literally starry eyed and they want to do astronomy. How can they do astronomy? So the other beauty of astronomy is that it brings into it what we call the STEM subjects science, technology, engineering, mathematics. It's a wonderful draw to get people engaged in what are some of the skill sets that you need for the future. But don't um, underestimate the power of astronomy. There's always a sky show going on, right? And who's gonna tell you all about it? You gotta call on the astronomers and the group of us that are engaged in it. So it is a wonderful, it's one of the most powerful beckoning of the human spirit and soul of where we come from, where our future is. And when I look back, there's a course that I designed and I teach history of science. And in that, you realize that the, the whole scientific revolution, it was Galileo, it was Newton, it was Kepler, um, Copernicus, and all of them were trying to understand the universe. And in so, terms of trying to understand the universe, we're going to continue with this conversation when we reach <laughs> the break. We're speaking with newly minted Professor Sharon Hack. Stay with us, we return with more. Welcome back. We are going in on the journey towards the professorship of Professor Sharon Hack. And the professor, you were saying that the power of astronomy, it beckons all of us. And I really like the fact that you're able to pull all these points together, because I think sometimes we look at one thing and think this is all it is, as though nature uh, is very happy to operate in a vacuum, which is very far from the case. But in terms of you looking and seeing where astronomy and astronomers and the and the, and the skill sets can be placed in a practical, functional way in society, I want to ask: What is interaction with your peers like? Um, internationally or locally? Or oh, this is just locally on campus because you're the you're the only oh. person who does what you do. <laughs> That's the thing. That's the thing. It's been a lonely, a very interesting path. 
because um, in the English speaking Caribbean, I still remain the only um, professional level astronomer. So it is a very lonely path. And as a matter of fact, it, globally, that's not really how research can happen. It's no longer a lone scientist journey, like it was say in the days of Einstein. It's all team effort. So a lot of our research projects are actually, um, we are in teams with uh, all over the world. And that's the, some of the research that we do in that path that way. So it is, um, like I say, many, there are so many young people and there are several graduate students right now who have done their MPhils in astronomy. And they are actually going on to greater parts. They're going abroad to um, further their studies. And it's really, really inspiring for me to see the enthusiasm for it, especially in Trinidad. How do you form your team? So where do you, if it's not a one scientist team anymore, not this lonely scientist, where do you find individuals from to help further your, your research interests? You know, DK, when, a couple, when you go through life and you see the decades slip away, you become reflective and then you look back and you're like, how did I get here? How did I happen to reach here? Could I have predicted I would have been here? Short answer is no. I was always interested in astronomy. My plan was that, well, I had two young children at the time, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna do data analysis so I could be home and do it comfortably. But as I returned from University of Virginia, we sort of just leaped into a project in collaboration with Finland, where we started to set up an observatory here. So your girl had no training, anything in observational astronomy, it's always a big learning path for us. And, and just when you think you've got the hang of it, so the first really research level observatory was set up at St. Um, it's called SATU, which stands for St. Augustine Tuorla. It's a Finnish word that means a tale too good to be true. So it was the beauty of our location on planet Earth. Trinidad is 10 degrees, 10 and a half degrees north of the equator. So we had amazing views of the skies, north and south. So the um, quasar, that's a sort of a black hole system that we were looking at, when it was not visible in Finland, we could monitor it from here. So that was one of the first big projects we got into. And just when you think you got the hand of it, hang of it, suddenly um, the big thing in astronomy became astrobiology. Where did life come from? Is there life out there in the universe? And you know, you think, DK, that you cannot contribute in such big questions from Trinidad and Tobago, from the Caribbean, but the story is a wonderful story because, and it almost seems like it's not related. We have a pitch lake, our natural resources. We have mud volcanoes. And here you're thinking, what does pitch lake and mud volcanoes have anything to do with astronomy? Well, it turns out, and these are so unique to us here, that these features act as what we call analogs to Saturn's largest moon, Titan, hydrocarbon lakes, pitch lake. And then you had mud volcanoes, which is bubbling, as you know. I hope you've gone down to see them, right? All of us. We have several in the south. And similarly, we would find methane on Mars. So we were able to study these sites and then these became the collaborative projects with other teams in Germany, in the United States. And so suddenly we were doing astrobiology. So I don't know what's gonna come next, but it's been, um, there's never a dull day or night in astronomy. And let me tell you why I appreciate this conversation, a professor. Sometimes you can be pursuing a junior academia and it feels as though it is just theoretical so you're not able to bring it from that aspect of theory to a practical functional thing uh so which is why i think some persons in mexico in belize central america in guatemala the study of archaeology is a living breathing thing because there are these things to be studied so the way that you're able to say, okay, well, this is something that is here. This is how we can use it is analogous to this. So we can you study this and get an idea how this may be possible. I think it's so powerful. But to the individual who doesn't know this before they, they start work at something that is possibly very similar in your, in your faculty at the UWI, is it that 
to study some of these things, they need to be doing uh, a major or a minor specifically, or are there modules, courses that um, they can do the prerequisites and then the course to get some of this information from you and individuals like that? Okay, so what you find is that the research degrees that are offered at UWE, which is MPhils and PhDs, you really require a powerful sense of um, independence and independent work. So the basis really of astronomy is maths and physics, but here I'm talking astrobiology. So if a student is a major in biology or chemistry, believe it or not, we will find them very um, valuable, their contribution. So the teams are very multidisciplinary. So our own team, we've got a microbiologist on it. We have a geologist, we have astronomers, then everybody comes together to work on the um, problem as it is. So you'll find that you definitely need that first degree to whatever field um, that you're aiming to go into. And beyond that, it's going to take a lot of self-study and specialized courses, which if they're not available here, we have some very good contacts abroad to fill in the gaps. Right, and in the two and a half minutes we have left, I wonder what kind of light, and pun intended, do you think that this, 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 this shift, this upgrade in status will have on the work that you do around? Because I remember two astronomy clubs in secondary schools, and both of them, they were on the basis of one person's passion. Uh, do you hope that this moves out a little more? People say, oh, well, look at Professor, look at Professor Hack. I, this is something I want to get involved in. What do you hope that accomplishes here in Trinidad and Tobago? I really hope somewhere that um, I can help provide an impetus for this to really grow and become even more universal because we have brilliant people with brilliant passion and many of them are my students. And I think, I hope that they can know that they can do it too. And what this has allowed for me is to build a lot of international bridges. And with that, they're getting a lot of opportunities and so on. So I hope for greater things as we move forward into the future. And I think many times all you want is that chance, you know, all you want is that opportunity, all you want is that foot in the door. Talk to me. Absolutely, absolutely. I think when there's a quote that says that chance favors the prepared person, and that's, that's why when you asked about my um, background and history, the word that stands out for me is serendipity. So for all the people who are watching, listening today, be prepared hold on to that passion and magic happens. I am testimony to that. <laughs> it's a magical universe. And we want to thank you for sharing some of that magic with us, Professor Sharon Hack. And on behalf of the entire TGT team, this has been In Depth with me, DK Roster. Thank you so much for joining us.